The third method we had is something you are. That's the biometric method. So what exactly is that? So obviously there are a variety of biometrics and it should be unique to you. Somebody else shouldn't be able to use a biometric feature or set of features to impersonate you. So what are some examples? Fingerprints are one. Uh, you swipe your finger, for example, uh, the touch ID and things like that, and they look for the pattern in your fingerprints. And based on that, they say it's really you. When it comes to keyboard, if nothing else, the way you type or the keystroke dynamics, you know, how fast you are, how long you take from one key to the next, depending on what the keys are and things like that. Sometimes that is used as a biometric features derived from, you know, the speed at which you type or pattern of your typing could be a biometric that's unique to you. Actually, we're seeing devices that do voice biometric authentication. They extract a set of features from your voice, which hopefully is unique to you, and that can be used when you talk to the device. It knows that it's really you. And of course, there are more intrusive and, and, and fancier ones like retina scans and things like that, which look for sort of unique patterns based on the blood flow in your eye and things like that. So these are basically what you are. The way these work is that you're going to claim it's you and you're going to swipe your finger or you talk in case of voice, uh, but the biometric measurement should be the same each time. If it's different, then of course we're going to have a, a false negative, isn't it? Uh, it's you, but you're not able to log in but because you have a cold and your voice is a little different. So maybe you don't have exact uh, these measurements. Maybe you have a probability distribution for your, the features that we extract from your biometric measurements. And of course, we're going to have false positives and false negatives as we have with each authentication method that we discussed. Here, if your biometric measurements change beyond a certain limit, then of course, you may not be able to log in, resulting in this false negative that we're talking about. So the basic way of implementing biometric is there has to be a biometric sensor. There's some user interface where you swipe your finger or camera takes a picture of you or, or you talk to it or whatever it is. The, the interface, the sensor, then from the biometric reading, we're going to extract a bunch of features that actually describe the reading that we just have from the sensor. And there has to be a biometric database that stores these features or something derived from these features. So PIN is here is sort of a separate thing we may have. In addition to PIN is something you know. So that's the secret. But So if you're just sort of going with biometric, you, you would not have the top line here. So the biometric database, essentially like a hash values for passwords, we have something that describes the biometric feature set and feature values for a given user. So once you extract the feature, we compare those. If there's a match between these two, then we allow authentication. If there isn't a match, then we're going to say you know, authentication is, is not allowed. So the idea is that you still have the enrollment problem. Somebody has to have a description of your biometric features, which is the database where we're storing it. The sensor has to read it. The features have to be extracted. The comparison or match has to happen. And that's how biometric authentication works. So rather than you typing a password, we sort of reading it through the interface and the sensor. And then it's sort of similar to what we had before.